So this weekend at Zion, we're kicking off a brand new series. Kind of excited about this series. It's going to be a summer-long series where here we're going to be walking through and working through a whole book of the Bible. We're going to be walking through and working through uh, the very first book of the Bible, uh, which is the book of Genesis. And here's kind of the deal with the book of Genesis. Even if you didn't grow up in church or maybe you don't read the Bible a lot or maybe you don't go to church a lot and you're just kind of here as kind of a one-off, you probably know at least a few of the stories in the book of Genesis. For example, you ever heard the one about Adam and Eve and the forbidden fruit? Anybody ever heard that one? Or uh, how about Noah and the big flood and the ark that he builds? Anybody ever heard that one? Or there are these two cities, their names are Sodom and Gomorrah, and they kind of struggle in what I would call like the holiness department, all right? They're not doing too well. And so God gets a little sideways and uh, he rains down fire and brimstone. That story scared the bejeebers out of me when I was a little kid and I heard it for the first time. Anybody else a little scared of that story? Or how about the one about Joseph? Joseph receives a very special gift from his dad. It's called a coat of, anybody know? Okay, so you've heard a few of these stories before. In fact, I think most people have heard a few of these stories before because, as I said, even if you don't read the Bible, come to church a lot, these are stories that just in our culture we tell. And and my guess is these are stories that, that you tell. These are stories you tell to your kids, maybe to your grandkids, maybe even to your great-grandkids. But here's what we're going to discover and uncover in this series as we work through it this summer. If the book of Genesis is just a bunch of stories that we tell and that you tell, well, then there's not much to study and there's not much here. But the book of Genesis is so much more than that. Because the book of Genesis is not just a collection of stories that we tell. It's actually a collection of stories that tell us. It's a collection of stories that tell us very important things about God, about life, about faith, about hope. It's a collection of stories that tell us what actually matters the most. And so here's what we're going to be doing in this series. We're going to be looking at these stories that we tell, and we're simply going to be asking this question, what can these stories that we tell tell us about our lives and about who God is? And so this weekend, as we kick off this series, we're going to start with the very first story in the book of Genesis, which is the story of creation. And so this is the first verse of the first chapter of the first book of of the Bible, and here's how that opens. Genesis 1 verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You ever heard these words before? Ever heard this story before just by a show of hands? I think part of the reason we've all heard this story is because this is not only one of the most famous lines in the Bible, this is actually one of the most famous lines in all of literature. And when I was growing up, I remember I had a kid's Bible. I don't know if you ever had one of those. But uh, my kid's Bible kind of formed the way that I thought this story took place. And so whenever I heard this line, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, uh, this is kind of what I envisioned, kind of what I pictured, okay? I figured that's the way that it looked when God first made everything. We had smiling animals, kind of a smiling elephant, a smiling lion. We had the nice little cow and the sheep, and we got Adam and Eve, and they look very happy there too. And we got the beautiful fruit trees, even the palm tree, got the beautiful blue sky, green grass, manicured lawn, clouds floating through the sky. In fact, the only thing that kind of puzzles me about this particular rendition is you see those two birds that are flying right toward each other? This is like angry birds in Genesis 1 verse 1, right? This is kind of the picture that I had in the back of my head when I read these words. In fact, it was so idyllic and so picturesque that it almost kind of sounded like a fairy tale, right? Once upon a time, God created the heavens and the earth, and that's how wonderful it looked. But actually, if you go back and you read and reread the story in Genesis, it didn't look quite like that, at least not initially. Because Genesis 1 verse 2 tells us how it looked when God first created the heavens and the earth. Here's how it looked. Now the earth was, was formless. It was almost like Play-Doh in God's hand. It was mushy, ushy, gushy. You could stretch it and pull it and reshape it. Not only that, it was empty. In other words, there were no animals. There was not Adam and Eve. There were no palm trees. There were no birds in the sky. It was just a vast, barren waste of a landscape. And not only that, there was darkness. So there are no clouds, at least that you could see, and there was certainly no blue sky because you couldn't even see your hand in front of your face. And not only that, the darkness was hovering over the surface 
of the deep. Now, this word deep in biblical terminology is actually a term for water. And so there was no grass, there were no trees, because there was no land. It was just a watery, dark, formless, almost kind of mess. What I thought was kind of a fairy tale, Once Upon a Time, actually starts out more like a scary movie. It was a dark and stormy night. But into the middle of all this darkness, all this formlessness, all this water, all this emptiness, we get this great line in Genesis 1 verse 2, because there is the Spirit of God, and He is hovering over the waters. So one of the things that my wife Melody likes to do is she likes to watch um, some shows on HGTV where they flip the homes. Anybody ever seen one of those shows? And it's amazing because you walk into the, one of those homes. I'll watch these with her every once in a while. And it's a house from 1952. And you know how much they've done to it since 1952? Not a thing. Right? It has wood rod all over the place. The carpet is original, has holes in it, kind of nasty. All the appliances in the kitchen, they don't work because they haven't been touched since 1978 like, or something like that. Right, you got the wood, you got the wallpaper that's kind of peeling off. Uh, you, you got you got the floors that kind of sag under you. You got the blue tile in the bathroom. You, you know what I'm talking about from from 1952. And so we got these, like, power remodeling couples that walk into one of these homes. And as soon as they do, you know, you're kind of looking at it and you're going, ugh, that's gross. Who'd want to live there? But they walk in and they're all excited. They love what they see. Because here's, here's the reality. They are able to see things that at least Melody and me are not able to see. Because in the middle of all of the wood rod and all of the carpet that's worn, all of the wallpaper that's, that's falling off and tearing apart, they're able to look past that. And they're able to look past everything that looks so damp and dank and drab and drear. And here's what they kind of say on these shows. I, I think there might just be something here. And so they'll start knocking out walls and adding windows to brighten the place up. They'll rip down the wallpaper, put a fresh coat of paint on there. By the time you get done with everything, a half an hour later, which, by the way, any remodeling project takes me way more than a half an hour. But by the time they're done a half an hour later, because they are fast, it's like you don't even recognize the house anymore. It's a brand new place because they can see what nobody else can see. Uh, when God first makes the heavens and the earth and there's darkness and there's water and it's a, it's a vast, barren landscape and it's formless, the Spirit of God is right there and He loves what He sees. He likes what He sees because even though it all looks dark and dank and drab and drear, here's what the Spirit of God is thinking. There might just be something here. And so what the Spirit of God does is he gets to work kind of flipping creation. And the first thing he does is he brightens the place up. Genesis 1 verse 3, God says, let there be lights. And all of a sudden, the light switch comes on, and there's light. And then in verse 6, God says, let there be a vault between the waters to separate the water from the water. Here's the idea. Everything was just kind of like a watery mess. And so what God does is he takes some of the water and he puts uh, puts it on earth. Uh, More of the water puts it up in the sky like the atmosphere with the clouds. And so now there's a separation and that was so. Verse 9, God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. And that was so. And then God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night. So we got the sun and the moon and the stars. And that was so. Verse 20, God said, let the water teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. And then God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, the wild animals, each according to its kind, and all that was so. And then finally, in verse 26, kind of the piece de resistance of God's creation. God says, let us make mankind, let us make people in our image. And in our likeness. And that was so. What began is kind of a dark and stormy night. What began is something that was dark and dank and drab and drear. By the time that God is through with it, looks a lot more than, looks a lot more like that picture that I remember in my kid's Bible. In fact, in reality, it it looks even better than that. It looks kind of like 
this. That's a snow-capped peak in Colorado. A few years ago, Melody and I went on a Colorado trip for our anniversary, and I snapped that photo. When I saw that, you know what I saw? I saw a glimpse of Genesis 1. Or it looks kind of like this. I was uh, going through the drive through at Starbucks one morning, <laughs> and a cardinal just landed right there on my side view mirror. Couldn't help but had to snap a picture of that because when I saw that, you know what I saw? I saw a little glimpse of Genesis 1. Or how about this? Every single year, me and my family, we go down to Port Aransas to the beach. It's my favorite place on earth. We're going to be going down there in a couple of weeks. And sometimes the sunrises over the Gulf of Mexico are just gorgeous. And so there was one morning a couple of years ago, I was walking down the beach and I snapped that picture. Because I knew that when I did, I was catching a glimpse of Genesis 1. These are all little glimpses of this story that we tell. The story of creation. But here's what I want to do in the balance of time that we have remaining in this message. I just want to ask the big question of this series, which is, what can this story that we tell actually tell us? What can we learn from Genesis 1 and the story of God's creation? Three things, and the first thing is this. First thing we learn is that all of this, all of this that we see around us, from the snow-capped peaks in Colorado to the cardinals that land on a side view mirror, to beautiful beach settings, to the, to the hilltop that we sit on, to the grass that we see, to the cows that are out there grazing in the field, all of that, all of this is no accident. Uh, so one of the big philosophical existential questions of life that sometimes we'll get asked is this. Um, why is there something rather than nothing? Another way to put it is uh, why is all that is here actually here? And where did all that is here actually come from? Uh, you know, Genesis 1 actually gives us a very clear, very concise, and very simple answer to this question. Why is all that is here here? Here's what it says. In the beginning, what? God. He's the reason there is something rather than nothing. He's the reason all that is here is here, because in the beginning, he created the heavens and the earth. Now, I do know this. Uh, that is not the only answer to that question that is out there. In 21st century, modern, enlightened, Western society, there are alternate answers to the question of why is there something rather than nothing. In fact, probably the most popular and prevalent alternate answer to that question is this. The reason that there is something rather than nothing is because of, well, just kind of dumb luck or random chance. Another way to put it is, well, this is amazing, but truth be told, it's all just kind of an accident. So there's a professor who taught many, many years. He taught physics at a Harvard and MIT. Smart guy, good guy, great guy. I disagree with him on this. He wrote an uh, essay several years back called The Accidental Universe, where he basically makes this case that all that we have, the reason that all that is here that is here is here, is because of an accident. He makes that case in this essay, and he says, uh, we're just nothing but an accident. From the cosmic lottery hat containing zillions of universes, because he believes in a multiverse, like there's not just this universe, but lots of them. We just happen to draw a universe that allowed life. This guy's name is Alan Lightman, and here's basically the way that Alan Lightman would explain the reason that there is something rather than nothing. In the beginning, an accident created the heavens and the earth. Now, Genesis 1 would disagree with Dr. Lightman. Now, let me try to explain to you why Genesis 1 would disagree with Dr. Lightman. Here's kind of the, the simplest way I know how to put it. So, uh, a few years back, my wife discovered this brownie mix. Okay, we love sweets in our, okay, I love sweets in our house. I eat a lot of them. And uh, this brownie mix is called No Pudge Brownie Mix, which means it's lower in sugar, lower in fat, which also means I can eat the whole pan in one <laughs> sitting. 
That's basically what it means. And then that cancels all of that out. But one of the nice things about No Pudge Brownie Mix is that it's super simple to make. All you need is the box of brownie mix, and you need uh, one of those little things of Yoplait vanilla yogurt. And you take the Yoplait vanilla yogurt, dump it out into the brownie mix, mix it all up, uh, put it in the pan, pop it in the oven for 30 minutes, and after 30 minutes, out come piping hot, delicious, ooey gooey, kind of chewy, not the real hard ones, but the gooey brownies. I love these things. And so I'm always asking my wife to make these things for me. And so let's just do a little thought experiment, okay? Let's say that just by an accident, okay? Let's say that Dr. Lightman is kind of right, and just by an accident, there were to appear a brownie pan, okay? How long do you think it would take for brownies to appear in this pan? How about we just stand here and see? And you thought my sermons have been long before. How long would it take? Well, I don't know the exact answer, but here's my not-so-scientific, not-so-specific answer. A long, stinking time. That's how long, right? In fact, let's just be honest. It probably would never, ever happen. So let's kind of up the ante, and let's just say that an accident happened, and we don't know where it came from or how it happened, but the ingredients appeared. So we got the brownie mix right here, and we got the, we got the Yoplait right here. How long would it take for these things to mix themselves together, pour themselves into a pan, pop themselves into an oven for 30 minutes and come out as piping hot brownies? How long would it take? A long stinking time. In fact, let's just be honest. It probably would never happen. And we kind of know this intuitively because here's what you need in order to get brownies. You need someone to actually say, let there be brownies. That's what you need. <laughs> and it was so. <laughs> hey, Josh, one's missing. <laughs> hey, can we thank Josh for his help? Here's the simple argument that Genesis is making, and it's really kind of intuitive when you think about it. In order to have creation, you actually need a cook. You need someone to say, let there be light. And all of a sudden, there's light. Here's another way to think about it, okay? You've heard the old saying, if it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, and quacks like a duck, what is it? It's a, it's a duck. Well, if all of this looks designed, feels designed, seems designed, appears designed, it needs designing, do you think there might just be a designer behind all of it? Or if all of this looks created, feels created, seems created, appears created, needs creating, do you think there might just be a creator behind it? I know it's a simple claim, but you kind of got to admit it's a bit of an intuitive claim. All this is no accident. That's the first thing the story that we tell can tell us. Second thing the story that we tell can tell us. It can tell us that God loves his creation. God loves his creation. Uh, one of the interesting historical features of the story is that this is not the only ancient creation story that there is out there. Just historically, we know that lots of ancient societies had their own creation stories. The Egyptians, they had a creation story. The Greeks, they had a creation story. The Persians, they had a creation story. The Romans, they had a creation story. And when archaeologists began to uncover and discover all of these ancient creation stories, all of these ancient creation documents back in the 1800s and 1900s, there was kind of this scholarly consensus that emerged that all of these creation stories were just borrowing from each other. They were just kind of mirroring and mimicking each other. And they were all not really creation stories. They were all kind of creation, well, myths. Because they never really happened. But one of the fascinating things in scholarship is that over the past 20, 30 years, that consensus has begun to fall apart. 
Because what scholars have begun to notice the more they've studied these ancient creation stories and compared them to the creation story in Genesis 1, they've begun to notice that the creation story in Genesis 1 isn't just mirroring and mimicking all of these other creation stories. It's actually competing with all of these other creation stories. In fact, more than that, it's trying to confront and subvert all of these other creation stories. I'm going to geek out on you here for just a second. So uh, there's an ancient Babylonian creation story. It was discovered um, in the late 1800s. It's known as the Enuma Elish. And if you went to high school or college, you may have heard of it before. You may have read it before. And it's the story of how everything was created according to the Babylonian perspective. And it begins with a Babylonian god whose name is Marduk. And the Babylonians believed in lots of gods. They had a whole pantheon of them. And so there's this Babylonian god, his name is Marduk, and he gets into a fight with the Babylonian goddess. Her name is Tiamat. And so they go to battle against each other, and Marduk happens to conquer Tiamat. In fact, more than that, Marduk actually kills Tiamat. And when he does, the Enuma Elish says this, Marduk pauses to view the dead body of Tiamat. He's almost kind of gloating over his victory. And he decides that he's going to divide the monster because that's what you call your vanquished foe. You call her a monster and do artful works. And so what does he do? He splits her like a shellfish in two. Half of her he sets up and he stretches it out as the sky. The other half he brings down and he stretches it out as the earth. You'll read that as the story continues. Now here's the thing. Whenever I read a creation story like this, I think two things, okay? With a story like that, Babylonian Sunday school had to be awesome, right? <laughs> I mean, wow. But here's the other thing, I think. If I just kind of process it, it's a bit disturbing, right? This is how everything gets created. With war and violence, bloodshed, envy, anger, hatred, murder, death, slaughter, If you've got to do a moral analysis of that, there's really only one thing to call it. Wicked. And this is why the Genesis 1 creation story doesn't mirror and mimic all of these other creation stories. Because all of these other creation stories begin with this kind of stuff. War and bloodshed and violence and God slaughtering each other. They begin with things that are wicked. But the Bible's creation story, the Genesis creation story, begins with a simple word. Let there be lights. Let there be birds that fly across the sky. Let there be trees and plants that spread across the ground. The Bible's creation story does not begin with something that is wicked. In fact, quite the contrary. Some of you may know this. There's this refrain that comes up again and again in the creation story when God makes stuff. When he makes the light, Genesis 1 verse 4, God saw that the light was what? Good. Or when God makes the ground in Genesis 1 verse 10, God saw that the ground was what? Good. Or when God makes the plants and the trees in Genesis 1 verse 12, God saw that all that stuff was what? Good. Or when God makes the sun and the moon and the stars in Genesis 1 verse 18, God saw that it was good. Or when God makes the birds and the trees and the fish and the seas in Genesis 1 verse 21, God saw that it was good. And then when God does get to that piece de resistance and he makes human beings and he finally finishes up on creation, I love this last refrain, Genesis 1 verse 31, God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was what? Very good. God's looking at his creation and he's going, this is awesome. This is good. All these other creation stories begin with battle and bloodshed and things that are bad. In Genesis 1, when God makes the heavens and the earth, he calls it good. He loves what he has made. Because God loves his creation. That's the second thing the story that we tell can tell us. Third thing that the story that we tell can tell us. It's not just that God loves his creation 
generally. It's that God loves you specifically and personally. So uh, back to that line from Genesis 1, verse 2. The earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. I think we need to be honest about something. That line right there, I don't think, is just a description of primordial creation. I think it can actually work pretty well as a description of our current modern day, sometimes even everyday lives. Because sometimes that's the way we feel. We feel formless and empty and dark. Maybe for you, it's that relationship that you're in, and you've been in it for like one year, two years, three years, five years, ten years, and you're kind of hoping that maybe it'll go somewhere, but it never seems to go anywhere. You're kind of hoping for the ring, but the ring never comes. You're kind of hoping for the DTR, the define the relationship, but that never happens. (laughs) And you kind of feel like you're stuck in Genesis 1 verse 2. because your relationship feels formless. Maybe for you, it's the addiction. You drink a little too much, or maybe you look at those pictures late at night that you know you shouldn't be looking at. Maybe it started completely innocently. You know, you had that surgery, you got on the pain pills, and then even though the surgery was years ago, you never got off the pain pills. And at first, it made you feel really good, but the longer you're on it, the worse you feel. And you kind of feel like you're stuck in Genesis 1, verse 2, because rather than any of that stuff filling you up, it just makes you feel empty. Maybe it's that secret. That thing that you did a long time ago that made you feel guilty, or maybe it was that thing that was done to you a long time ago that to this day still covers you in shame. And it's kind of like there's a dark blot and blight on your soul and you feel like you're stuck in Genesis 1 verse 2. Because you're trapped in darkness. If this is where you are at, this is what I want you to know. Okay? The Spirit of God is hovering over the waters. And even when it feels like things are formless, and even when it feels like things are empty, and even when it feels like things are dark and drab and drear, the Spirit of God is thinking to himself, you know what? There might just be something here. And out of that, what he does is he fashions a new creation. Here's another way to think about it. So in Jeremiah 4, uh, the people of Israel, they're really struggling. They're not doing so well. They're falling into sin. They're sinning against their neighbors. They're sinning against their people. And so God comes to Jeremiah, and God has something to say to Jeremiah about the people of Israel's sinful state, and it's not good. Here's what he says, Genesis 4, verse 22. These people are so skilled in doing evil, but they don't know how to do good. In other words, they're bad at being good, but they're real good at being bad. And Jeremiah hears this word from God, and then finally he looks around at the world, the world that Israel's living in, and here's what he sees. He says, I looked at the earth, and look at this. It was formless and empty. And I looked at the heavens, and their light was gone. It was dark and drear because this is what sin does to the world, and this is what sin does to our lives. It makes me and you feel like we're living in Genesis 1, verse 2. 
But if that's where you're at, I want you to know something. It's not just that the Spirit of God is hovering over the waters. It's that God has sent His Son into our world and into our lives. And when Jesus looks at all of that stuff, when He looks at our sinfulness and our brokenness, even when things look dark and dreary, Here's what he has to say. I think there just might be something here. Is it any wonder the Apostle Paul can write in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17, if anyone is in Christ, he's a what? A new creation. The old is gone. And the new is come. Here's what that means. It means that formless relationship that you're stuck in. Christ has a relationship for you, and it's as clear and as formational as a cross. Here's what that means. That addiction that makes you feel empty, Christ has fullness for you. It's as beautiful and as filling as His grace. Here's what that means, that darkness that you feel stuck in because of something you did or something that was done to you, Christ is the light for you. He shines the light of His mercy to just wash out and blot out. your struggle and sin. That's what it means to be a new creation. I was thinking about this. Wouldn't it have been kind of fun to be around there for the Genesis 1 creation? Wouldn't that have been great? To hear the words, let there be light. And then all of a sudden, you look up and there are all these lights. Or to hear God say, let the land appear, and all of a sudden you look, and the waters recede, and out comes the land. Or for God to say, let the birds fly across the expanse of the sky, you look up, and there they are. You know the great thing about this story? And you know why it still matters so much for our lives? The story of creation didn't stop in Genesis 1. It continues all the way up to 2023. And here's why. Because of Christ, there's a new creation that's happening right now. In you and in me. And behold, that is very, Let's stand and pray.